So it is a pleasure to uh, be able to give this uh, lecture on diagnostic approaches in connective tissue disease, IOD. I'm Elisabetta Rizzoni and I work as an IOD physician at the Royal Brompton Hospital in London. These are my disclosures. So in a patient with IOD, why is it important to assess for an underlying connective tissue disease? And that's because it can impact uh, on the prognosis. We know from a number of studies that prognosis is better in the context of CTD IOD compared to the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. It will change our approach to treatment, but also we will be aware of the possibility of extrathoracic involvement also affecting respiratory symptoms. IOD can be the first manifestation of an underlying connective tissue disease, and it's important to remember that extrathoracic manifestations can be subtle, and therefore the importance of really looking for CTG symptoms, extrathoracic features, and screening for autoimmune serology in all patients who present with an interstitial lung disease. And the symptoms that we most commonly look for are Raynaud's, the presence of sclerodactyly or scleroderma, teleinjectasias, inflammatory bilateral arthritis of the hands, proximal muscle weakness in the case of myositis, mechanics hands, gotrum popules, gastroesophageal reflux symptoms are common, but they're not specific. And here we have a few examples up here, Raynaud's, the puffy hands of scleroderma. Here you can see the gotron papules, those skin rash on the extensive surfaces of the knuckles. Here we've got the cracked hands. It's usually the lateral surfaces of the fingers um, uh, that make up the mechanics hands that you see in antisynthetase and xerostomia and uh, teleinjectasias down here. In all patients with IOD, we would perform an autoimmune screen. In all patients, we would perform anti-nuclear antibodies. The most common extractable nuclear antibody panel, including SCL70, JO1, uh, PMSCL, et cetera, CCP antibodies. And then only in selected patients, we would extend the autoimmune screen to include an extended myositis panel with the rarer antisynthetases MDA5 and mycetes associated antibodies. We know that certain patterns are more frequent in certain connective tissue diseases. And I will be discussing the patterns in scleroderma or systemic sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, idiopathic inflammatory mycetes, and then in the end, touch on interstitial pneumonitis with autoimmune features. So, uh, ILD occurs in the majority of patients with uh, scleroderma. Uh, however, its severity is very variable. One can go from very mild, stable disease to clinically significant disease. And it is now the main cause of death in patients with systemic sclerosis, followed by palmy hypertension. The most common morphological pattern is NSIP. And you can see here an example of fibrotic NSIP, ground glass and mixed with traction bronchiectasis suggestive of established fibrosis. We know that in a patient with systemic sclerosis, the likelihood of IOD involvement also depends on the extent of skin disease, more likely in diffuse than in limited skin disease, and on the type of antibodies, autoantibodies. So certain autoantibodies are very commonly associated with uh, um, IOD, such as SCL70 and others less. And in this paper by Nitya Nova et al, um, the proportion of patients uh, developing significant IOD was followed over time. And one can see that the great majority of patients, about 80% of patients with SCL70 positive antibody, developed extensive IOD within five years, followed by at the lower end of the spectrum, patients with anti-centromere antibodies, which we know are only rarely associated with significant extensive IOD. 
We know that the severity of the disease is important to predict survival. So according to the staging system by Nicole Goh and Professor Wells and co-authors, one can look at the CT extent. And if it is definitely more than 20%, you have extensive disease, less than 20% limited. And if you're undecided, you look at the force vital capacity, if it's less than 70% extensive, if it's more limited. And the reason for having this staging is that it does provide very good prognostic separation. And you can see that patients with the SSC extensive IOD have a survival, a median survival of around six years, five to six years, which is not that dissimilar from a survival of an IPF patient. We also know that short-term changes in lung function trends are also predictive of mortality. So either a decline in FVC by at least 10% or a marginal decline in FVC coupled with TOCO at least 15% predicts mortality in extensive disease. And the decline in TOCO of at least 50% at two years was the strongest predictor of mortality. And we've also looked at uh, pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis in systemic sclerosis, uh, its prevalence and prognostic impact in two cohorts, one from the Brompton, 228 patients, one from a city in uh, university in Italy, Ancona, 131 patients. And without going into details of the scoring system, uh, PPFE uh, was divided into mild, moderate, or severe extent. It was scored by two independent radiologists. And if there was disagreement, a third experienced scorer adjudicated the score. And just as an example, this is an example of a patient with severe PPFE at the apices and then a fibrotic NSIP pattern at the bases. We found that PPFE was present in 18% of scleroderma IOD patients in both cohorts and that it was predictive of a worse survival. Here in red, the patients with the, the Kaplan-Meier curve for survival for patients with PPFE significantly worse than those without, even after adjusting for disease severity, cohort and demographic features. Moving on to the myositis spectrum disorders, we know that these can have a wide range of presentation, ranging from acute, presenting with life-threatening disease over the course of only a few days, weeks, to subacute to chronic. And as an example, this 55-year-old man, non-smoker, had always been well with no drugs, no exposures, and he presents in respiratory failure at the a &E with two months of progressive breathlessness and fatigue and only mild muscle weakness. He had a negative history and examination for connective tissue disease. He had raised CRP, but infectious markers, including procalcitonin, were negative. Interestingly, he had high titer cytoplasmic antibody, sorry, uh, and he could not have a bowel because of high oxygen requirements, but he had extended serological and urinary tests for infectious organisms and they were all negative and he did not respond to broad spectrum antibiotics. His CT shows widespread patchy ground glass bordering on consolidation at the basis. And you can see there's a bit of bronchocentricity of the consolidation at the basis. He was treated with IV methylprednisolone, did not respond, and therefore was treated with IV cyclo and rituximab, repeated after two weeks, and then introduced mycophenolate, and he made a gradual and progressive improvement. And the response of the, EN, of the extended myositis screen only came back after a month, and he was one of the rarer, he had one of the rarer anti-synthetases, PL7 antibody. 
So from this very interesting French multicenter retrospective study, looking at patients that presented to a &E, to AICU, sorry, and had either antisynthetase antibodies or MDA5 uh, across 35 ICUs in France, and they almost all had acute lung injury, most severe. And importantly, uh, a third of these patients had no extrapulmonary manifestations. Only 20% had raised uh, muscle enzymes. They all received broad spectrum antibiotics, IV steroids, and the majority received other intensive immunosuppression. On uh, analysis, consolidation on CT was associated with a better prognosis, ground glass with a worse prognosis, although the relationship disappeared after adjusting for MDA5. And MDA5 had a much worse survival, so in hospital death of 84% versus 18% in those with antisynthetase antibodies. So ILD may be the first manifestation of an underlying myositis spectrum disorder. As we've seen, the extrathoracic manifestations can be subtle. And it's important to screen with the autoimmune serology, uh, muscle enzyme, inflammatory markers, and just have a low threshold for thinking about this. These are patients that, that can be easily misinterpreted as infectious pneumonia. And a high index of suspicion for an autoimmune background is needed. Often there is a few weeks or even months of delay between onset of symptoms and AICU admission. There's an absence of cause by basal consolidation and, of course, raised inflammatory markers, but negative infectious markers. And among the myositis specific and associated antibodies, those that are more commonly associated with this type of presentation are the antisynthetase antibodies and MTA5 antibodies. And here we have a schematic of the different, um, different characteristics. We don't have time to go through these, but I recommend both of these reviews if you would like to uh, learn, read more. In the context of the more chronic type of presentation, a number of studies have shown that in terms of the CT pattern, the most common is organized pneumonia and NSIP, whereas the UIP pattern is quite rare and indeed in some series was not present at all. And when we're looking at the different types of NSIP, we can see there are some differences between the chronic NSIP of scleroderma, for example, which is gradually progressive, and the subacute NSIP that we see frequently in the myositis spectrum disorder, where a subacute presentation is more frequent and where there is an overlap between NSIP and organizing pneumonia. And the presence of this more inflammatory uh, pattern uh, probably explains the fact that these patients usually do quite well on immunosuppression. And as you can see here, whether treated with azathioprine or mycophenolate, FBC tends to inc increase on average over the years, and, um, and DLCO increases or stabilizes. In rheumatoid is the only connective tissue disease where a UIP pattern is at least as frequent as NSIP. It has several risk factors that overlap with IPF, including older age, a history of smoking, male gender, and certain genetic variants such as MOOC5b. Um, there is an increased risk with a longer duration of RA and also with increased RA joint disease activity. And in this study from the Brompton, one can see that compared to IPF patients, this is a survival curve in blue are the, in, in black, sorry, are the IPF patients. In blue are those with extensive uh, IOD with a UIP pattern, limited IOD with a UIP pattern and a non-UIP pattern. So one can see that once disease is extensive and the patient has a UIP pattern, the survival is very similar to IPF, quite different from those that have a limited non-UIP pattern. <laughs> 
And just to mention this study about methotrexate and risk of RA IOD, this was an excellent case control study, a discovery set comparing patients with RA IOD and those with RA no IOD, and then an international replication set. And what they found in all of the cohorts that were evaluated was that there was an inverse relationship between methotrexate exposure and RA IOD. Whereas for years we had been worried that methotrexate could be contributing to progressive pulmonary fibrosis. And indeed, the opposite was found that IOD was detected later in methotrexate treated patients. Uh, 11 years compared to only four years in methotrexate never users, and there was no difference um, in the prevalence of UIP pattern. So although uh, methotrexate can be associated with an acute subacute pneumonitis, it seems it is not associated with progressive, gradually progressive fibrotic lung disease. And finally, just a few words about interstitial pneumonitis with autoimmune features. So as we all know, there is a significant proportion of patients with IOD who has features of autoimmune disease without fitting into a, a neat a rheumatological diagnosis. And so straddles somewhere between CCDIOD and the idiopathic entities. Uh, this is not a diagnosis, but it is a proposal by an ERS ATS uh, task force to classify these patients. And so they have to have at least one feature from at least two of three domains, clinical, serological, or morphological. And these include the clinical domain, a number of symptoms, which we've looked at, serological domain, so presence of specific antibodies, and the morphological domain. Without going into detail, this is the largest study uh, looking at retrospectively uh, survival according to whether patients had IPATH, CTD, or IPF, and then subdividing us as to whether patients had a UIP or non-UIP pattern. So you can see here on the left that IPF in pink had the worst survival, IPATH was in the middle, and the better survival was CTD, IOD. But once the presence of UIP is taken into account, UIP has an equally bad survival, whether it's idiopathic or associated with IPATH, and a non-UIP pattern has a better survival. Then finally, there is this uh, interesting study looking specifically at myositis-specific antibodies. So this study looked at patients meeting IPATH criteria, and they had to have either myositis-specific antibodies, and these were the spice specific antibodies tested, so all the various antisynthetases and MDA5. Myositis-associated antibodies without the specific ones, and then patients that had neither the specific nor the associated antibodies. These patients with IPATH were compared with those meeting idiopathic inflammatory myositis criteria, with other types of CTD, and with IPF. Overall, patients with idiopathic inflammatory myositis had the best survival, followed by CTD IOD, followed by IPATH, followed by IPF. But then if they looked at the different IPATH subgroups, so up here we have um, IPATH that have neither myositis specific or associated antibodies. And clearly patients with a UIP pattern in the red dotted line do worse than those with the blue line. Then we have patients with IPATH divided again according to UIP in the red line, um, non-UIP in the blue line that have myositis associated antibodies. And again, a UIP pattern is associated with a worse survival. And then we have patients with myositis specific antibodies. So the antisynthetases and MDA5. And you can see that there is no difference in survival, but also that there is a higher proportion of patients that have an NSIP pattern in this group, because here the patients with UIP were only six. So 
Overall, patients with IPAF and mycitis specific antibodies had a very similar survival to the idiopathic inflammatory mycitis and better than all the other groups. So in this, uh, the authors of this paper suggested that those patients meeting IPAF criteria with mycitis specific antibodies, but not the associated ones, had similar clinical features and outcomes to idiopathic uh, myosi inflammatory mycitis. Uh, if treated with immunosuppressants, and they suggest removing the mycitis-specific antibodies from the IPAF criteria and managing as per idiopathic inflammatory mycitis. Clearly, this requires further study, but it is an interesting finding. So in conclusion, we should always consider the possibility of an underlying CTD in all patients with IOD. When while in systemic sclerosis, the most common pattern is a fibrotic NSIP pattern. In the context of myositis spectrum disorder, you have a more subacute NSIP, so an overlap between organized pneumonia and NSIP, which seems to be the most frequent. In rheumatoid arthritis, UIP is at least as frequent as NSIP and is associated with a worse survival. And the diagnosis can be particularly difficult in the acute setting. So we should all have a very low threshold for considering underlying autoimmune disorder, even in the absence of extrapulmonary manifestations. And with this, I very much look forward to our discussion. Thank you.